the Curtis Jenny, the trainer that taught Americans to fly in battle. The Spat 13, one of the French fighters America flew to war. The Fokker D7, the deadliest opponent Allied airmen faced in 1918. In the last few months of the war, military aviation produced giants like this huge Handley Page bomber. Air power combined with ground forces with deadly war-winning consequences. General Pershing and his American Expeditionary Force began fighting on the Western Front in late 1917. But American air power was much slower to make an impact. In America, the tall, straight forests of the Pacific Northwest were felled for wings and airframes. American automotive genius was harnessed to build a 400 horsepower aircraft engine, the Liberty. 640 million dollars were voted by Congress for military aviation. But America's aviation industry was almost non-existent. The only choice was to build American versions of foreign designs. The British de Havilland DH-4 was a two-seater reconnaissance bomber, cynically called the Flaming Coffin. A US manufactured version with the Liberty engine became America's major aircraft to serve in the war. No American fighter would see combat. In 1917, America decided to buy its fighters from Europe. Battle-hardened SPADs and Newports from France would have become the major aircraft of American pursuit squadrons. By 1917, America's experience in military aviation was limited. In March 1916, General Pershing used aerial support in a punitive expedition against Pancho Villa in Mexico. Eight Curtis JN-3s of the 1st Aero Squadron performed reconnaissance. They were slow and unreliable. Their contribution to the campaign was not great. Thirty-eight thousand Americans volunteered for war service in military aviation. Those accepted as pilots entered flight training. There were two months of ground courses conducted on eight college campuses across America. After that, recruits progressed to primary flight training. The fuel valve down there. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, oil pressure. The standard primary trainer was America's classic Curtis JN4 Jenny. 2,500 feet, I'd like you to make three circuits of the field. Okay, sir. And uh, after the last landing, I'd like you to taxi back. Now, I want to make sure... The Jenny was a slow, stable, dual-control two-seater. Almost 18,000 volunteer pilots climbed into cockpits like this, hoping to become aces in the war in Europe. If they succeeded in graduating from primary training, they would go on to advanced courses in France, Britain, or Italy. The Jenny would become one of the most widely used of all training aircraft.
Jennies were exported to Britain, France and Canada. 32 of them were in service in England in 1915, well before America entered the war. Only experienced pilots could perform aerobatics in a jenny. Low speed and high drag limited the range of stunts they could do. Top speed was only 70 miles an hour, and the rate of climb was slow. But as basic trainers, Jennies were extremely effective. After the war, they were used for years by flying schools and barnstormers. Would-be fighter pilots had to learn to shoot at moving targets and from a moving aircraft. Student pilots who took advanced training in France found themselves contending with clipped-wing ground aircraft called penguins. The road to becoming a fighter ace was not easy. When America entered the war in April 1917, Germany moved to counter the contribution they expected the US to make to the Allies. Germany's America program was designed to enlarge its air service. It was intended to increase aircraft production to 2,000 a month. It planned to double the output of aviation fuel. At first, new fighters like this Faltz flowed to the front. Then the Allied naval blockade slowed the supply of raw materials. Manpower was short production dropped. This is a monument a few miles outside Paris. It commemorates the Lafayette Escadrille, the American volunteer squadron that had been fighting in France since early 1916. The exploits of the Escadrille had become legendary among the American public. But the American military took little notice of the valuable lessons these volunteer pilots learned in France. In January 1918, Captain Georges Tenot, the Escadrille's French commanding officer, passed on his office to Major Bill Thor. Under Thor, the Escadrille became the 103rd Pursuit Squadron. The legendary group of volunteers was now an American unit, but still under French command. Eventually, on July the 4th, 1918, the 103rd Pursuit Squadron was completely transferred to the American Air Service. The first new American air unit to reach the front was the 95th Pursuit Squadron. Being at the front and establishing a base was a beginning. But if there were no planes to fly, it was futile. And the 95th Pursuit Squadron had no planes. When Newport 28s eventually began to arrive, they had no guns. For the 95th Pursuit Squadron, it was a frustrating period. The 95th's commanding officer was supposed to be the Lafayette ace, Raoul Loughbury, on the right. But Loughbury was appointed to head the 94th, the squadron with the famous hat in the ring insignia. The 94th also suffered from lack of machine guns. Loughbury complained, It's nearly a year since the United States declared war. 
And what do you suppose the 94th is doing? Waiting for machine guns. Lovebury took his new pilots on patrols in their weaponless aircraft. One of them was Eddie Rickenbacker, a tough-talking 27-year-old racing driver. For the moment, tough talking was about as close to real action as the 94th and 95th could come. The biggest danger was boredom from extended inactivity. At least the 95th got a new commanding officer who lifted a ban on drinking wine. In May 1918, the 94th and 95th squadrons were moved to the old cathedral town of Toul, 200 miles east of Paris. At Toul, Douglas Campbell and Alan Winslow shared the 94th's first victory. Winslow got an Albatross D5, and moments later, Campbell destroyed a Faust III. Other successes followed. But there were also casualties. American pilots quickly learned the unforgiving ways of war. Take the cylinder out of my kidney, the connecting rod out of my brain. From the small of my back, take the camshaft and assemble the engine again. The 94th established an unofficial hierarchy. Pilots waiting for planes were called vultures. Buzzards had planes but no kills. With the first kill, a buzzard graduated to the rank of goofer. Raoul Lufbery, with 17 victories, was leader by rank and example. On May the 19th, Lufbury took off and attacked a German rumpler. Lufbury's plane was hit, and he fell out of the cockpit before it crashed to the ground. His death was a shock to the Americans. They'd lost one of their few battle-hardened pilots. At his burial, Newports flew overhead their pilots dropped handfuls of flowers. The funeral was one of the most impressive of the war. The French mourned with the Americans. Lufbery, flying with the Escadrille Lafayette, had been a hero to France for almost two years. Some American fighter squadrons were trained in British flying schools and fought in British aircraft. These are Sopwith Camels of the 148th American. The 148th and the 17th were highly respected by the British. They fought on the British front in western France. Most Americans fought in the east. More than 900 Americans trained and served with British squadrons. They were often reluctant to leave. Even as cadets, they were treated as officers. In American units, cadets were given much lower status. They had a chance to rub shoulders with the best, like rising British ace Mick Manock. Americans attached to British units in 1918 witnessed a period of crucial change. The two British air services, the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service, were amalgamated to form the Royal Air Force. Britain's air service had been divided just before the war. The Royal Flying Corps was controlled by the Army, but the Royal Naval Air Service took its orders from the Admiralty. 
In true British naval tradition, it was fiercely independent. The RNAS pioneered the aircraft carrier and performed successful long-distance bombing raids. All major powers used naval air services. They operated seaplanes, flying boats, and sometimes conventional aircraft in all major theatres of the war. Britain was the first country to see the potential of large flying boats for reconnaissance and anti-submarine patrols. This is a giant Felixstowe flying boat with a wingspan of almost 100 feet. It evolved from American Curtis designs used by Britain from the early days of the war. The Felixstowe F2 could stay in the air for seven hours. It carried a large bomb load for destroying submarines. Rivalry developed between the sea and land air arms. Bickering and lack of coordination led to inefficient operation. In April 1918, the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps were united under one command. The Royal Air Force was born. Colonel Billy Mitchell was fiercely independent. In the spring of 1918, he was the American Chief of Air Service. German forces were converging here in the valley of the Marne River, closer to Paris than they'd been since the first weeks of the war. With a handful of aircraft, Mitchell was charged with assisting the French against the strong, experienced German fighter squadrons. The opposing forces faced each other across the Marne, at Chateau Thierry, for one of the most crucial battles of the war. On June the 5th, the Germans reached the Marne. The French prepared to evacuate Paris. Mitchell's French counterpart wanted American aircraft to fly defensive patrols. To Mitchell, that was suicide. American losses in the air were heavy. But on the ground, the Allies managed to halt the Germans. It was the turning point of the war. The Spad 13 was the standard new generation French fighter in 1918. It was well armed, fast and tough. In March, America bought almost 900 Spads. Slowly, they began to trickle into American squadrons, replacing outdated Newport 28s. But in the spring of 1918, the Allies found themselves facing the greatest German fighter of the war, the Fokker D-7. The D-7 won a competition in January 1918 to select the new German fighter. At the time, Tony Fokker was out of favour with the German military because of his triplane structural failures. The D-7 was championed by Manfred von Richthofen. But the German squadrons were reluctant to accept it at first. Pilots used to the agility and fast climb of the triplane didn't like the D-7's very different way of handling. The D-7 was ordered by the German air service in large quantities. Several manufacturers beside Fokker were licensed to produce it.
Like the Albatross, most D7s were powered by the 160 horsepower Mercedes inline engine, but some used a new 185 horsepower BMW, which gave faster top speed and a higher rate of climb. The fuselage had a welded steel tube frame. The top decking was plywood and the skin was stretched fabric. The D7 was very easy to fly. Novices could manage it without fear. It was not particularly fast. Its 118 miles an hour top speed could be outrun by most new Allied fighters. But it climbed extremely well and could recover quickly from a dive. It retained excellent controllability at slow speeds and high altitudes. could also fly slowly, hanging on its prop, firing up into the belly of an opposing aircraft. D-7s began to enter combat in May 1918. By autumn, most German fighter squadrons on the Western Front were flying the D-7. It set a new standard in all-round fighter performance and was more than a match for any of the new Allied pursuit aircraft. At a time when the tide of the war on the ground was turning against Germany, the D-7 asserted air superiority for the last time. Manfred von Richthofen didn't ever get a chance to test the D-7 in combat. He flew it in trials, but was killed before it entered service. Hermann Göring, commander of Jasta 27, was one of the first squadron leaders to fly the D-7 in battle. He received his just before he took command of von Richthofen's flying circus in July 1918. In April, before the Fokker D-7 joined the war, German fighters destroyed 217 Allied aircraft. In June, after the D-7 entered service, this was more than doubled to 487. 565 were destroyed in August, and 560 in September. At the same time, German losses were less than a third of those experienced by the Allies. At first, American observation squadrons depended on the Allies for their supply of aircraft. They made do with obsolete Sopwith, Spad and Doran two-seaters. It was May before they began to receive their first up-to-date plane, the French Samson. The Samson was a two-seat day bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. Its most unusual feature was a water-cooled radial engine. Its performance wasn't high, but at last American observation squadrons had something dependable. made good use of it for photographic reconnaissance. Seven hundred of the three thousand Samsons built went to American squadrons. In 
In the summer of 1918, the French aviation industry struggled to keep up with the demands of the war. Aircraft production was improving, but slow engine manufacture limited the number of new aircraft reaching the front. One of the most important French engines was the 300 horsepower Renault to power the Breguet 14 bomber reconnaissance aircraft. The Breguet 14 was introduced to French squadrons in late 1917. This Breguet observer has to be helped into his cockpit because of a wounded leg. He chooses to leave his crutches behind. In the summer of 1918, American observation squadrons were still waiting to receive American-produced DH-4s. In the meantime, Breguet 14s were a welcome substitute. America's optimistic plans to produce 22,000 aircraft in a year had not materialized. The aviation industry was in disarray. It was investigated by the Senate Committee on Military Affairs and placed under a powerful civilian executive. This is the American first air depot at Colombe les Belles in the summer of 1918. From here, new aircraft were delivered to nearby operational airfields. Obsolete aircraft were sent from here to salvage. By summer, the long-awaited American-produced DH-4s were arriving for distribution to the front. But there were many complaints. The airframe was too weak to allow the Liberty engine to be run at full throttle. The lack of self-sealing gas tanks made fire likely if they were hit. Initially, DH-4s were resisted by crews who'd become used to Samsons and Breguets. But this resistance was gradually overcome and the DH-4 became a cornerstone of American air power. In America, production of DH-4s began to accelerate in May. 153 were built in the month. But by July the 1st, only 67 had found their way to the front. This film shows General Benjamin Fulloy who'd flown with Orville Wright in Army Air Trials in 1909, inspecting one of the new DH-4s in France. On August the 7th, 1918, 15 brand new DH-4s of the 135th Observation Squadron were prepared for takeoff. It was an event of great significance for American air power It was the first time a fully American trained and equipped squadron made a flight over enemy lines. Crowds gathered and cameras rolled. Up until this day, American efforts in the air had needed assistance from the Allies. There was dense cloud to 12,000 feet. Nobody really knew where the mission was going to take them. The important thing was that American air power was at last achieving some independence. And in the next few months, that independence would grow rapidly. The DH-4 would go on to find favor with its American crews. It would prove to be faster than the French brigades and could even be used to stand in for fighters in squadron protection duty. It would perform with distinction in day bombing and reconnaissance. Eventually, more than 1,800 American-produced DH-4s would reach France, some of them in time for the biggest aerial offensive of the war.
On the right is Colonel Billy Mitchell. In September 1918, he had command of 101 squadrons. They included French, American, British, and Italian units. Mitchell planned to use this air power in a new way. For the first time, he would closely coordinate aerial forces with troops on the ground. Bombers, reconnaissance aircraft, and fighters would be coordinated with the American First Army in a broad strategic plan. The latest aerial technology would be thrown against the German forces. The object of the operation was to remove the Germans from the Saint Michel area, southeast of Verdun. German forces had been established there since the beginning of the war. An Allied breakthrough would open the shortest way into Germany. Mitchell's plan needed detailed preparation. It involved striking before Germany could assemble its air power to defend Saint Michel. It was a great logistical challenge. Fifteen different makes of aircraft had to be supplied with bombs of various sizes, guns, ammunition, fuel, and spare parts. Technology had advanced. Bomb sites were more sophisticated. Accuracy had increased. In the last year of the war, French Breguet squadrons dropped more than 1,800 tons of explosive on German troops. This is the Michelin automatic bomb release in the wing of a Breguet 14. The Breguet was well armed. Here its synchronized Vickers machine gun is being tested. It was mounted on the left hand side of the fuselage and operated by the pilot. Preparations for the Saint Michiel offensive began in August and continued through until early September. They were hampered by terrible weather and some of the supplies needed for the huge air armada were difficult to obtain. There were many mishaps. Planes crashed or were not delivered. But slowly, the extremely complex task of preparing Mitchell's force was completed. In a way, the poor weather in northeastern France, the worst for many years, was a help. It allowed the huge forces to assemble in secret. As the crews of the Air Armada prepared to go into battle on September the 12th, a tremendous artillery barrage was directed at Saint Michiel. The attack came as a complete surprise to the Germans. At Saint Michiel, Billy Mitchell commanded an immense aerial force of 1,481 aircraft. But not all of them were fit for service. Ground troops began a pincer movement to encircle Saint Michel. French aircraft joined the battle. Mitchell ordered them to perform their own pincer movement in the air, sweeping in alternately from right and left in large numbers. He hoped that as many as 200 planes at a time could be seen from the ground. Many pilots flying in this operation were novices who'd never crossed enemy lines. 
Some aircraft would bomb, some would strafe ground troops, and some would take photographs deep in enemy territory. It had all been done before, but never on this scale. This is an Italian Caproni bomber. Three Italian squadrons of Capronis were part of Mitchell's force. Caproni began producing large bombers in 1914. The biplane version, the Caproni 33, was the most common. Its wingspan was 73 feet, making it almost as large as the German Gothas. It had three Isotta Fraschini engines. It could fly at 16,000 feet for up to six hours. It had twin tail booms instead of a rear fuselage and a distinctive triple tail. It could carry only 880 pounds of bombs, a small load for its size. Captain Fiorello LaGuardia, later mayor of New York, was part of an American contingent to Italy in 1917 to fly Capronis. In the San Michel campaign, Capronis were not the largest aircraft. That honor went to the giant British Handley Page 0400s. In June 1918, Britain established the Independent Air Force for strategic bombing strikes into Germany. It was scoffed at by some authorities, but supported by Billy Mitchell. 48 Handley Pages were made available to Mitchell for the San Miguel campaign. They could carry twice the bomb load of the Capronis, 1,800 pounds, and enough fuel to keep them in the air for eight hours. Mitchell's plan to support ground troops with massive air power worked. As the infantry advanced, waves of aircraft took off to pound the German positions. The Allied forces blasted deep into German territory behind Saint Michel. They were countered by little more than 200 German aircraft which had no hope of dealing with the Allied numbers. German resistance had little effect. In four days, from September the 12th, the Allies made more than 3,000 flights over German lines. Thirty thousand rounds of machine gun ammunition were fired and 75 tons of bombs were dropped. By September the 16th, German forces had been driven from San Michel. After the Battle of San Michel, Eddie Rickenbacker was given command of the American 94th Pursuit Squadron. Morale was low. Losses in the spring had been heavy. The 94th was re-equipped with new SPAD-13 fighters. Rickenbacker was a natural leader. He encouraged his pilots to become the top American fighter squadron. He set a positive example. Within a week, he shot down three German planes by the end of October, flying aggressively and often, he had 24 victories. On October the 13th, he had his last two victories of the war. His final conquest was not an aircraft, it was a balloon. His total of 26 kills made him the highest scoring American pilot of the war. 
the tough-talking racing driver, considered by some to be too old to fly in combat, had left his mark on the Western Front. He'd been fighting for only six months, but America had a hero to rank with the great flying aces of Britain, France and Germany. On the ground, the end of the war approached quickly. The Allied offensive in the Argonne Forest was the last great battle. Allied aircraft dropped bombs, preventing a German counterattack. German forces were pushed back. The German air service kept flying. By now they lacked fuel and other critical materials. But in the last weeks of the war, their spirits were lifted by a deadly new Fokker fighter. To pilots accustomed to biplanes with supporting struts and wires, the Fokker D-8 came as a surprise. It had a single high cantilever wing. It used a rotary engine. Germany had a good supply of 110 horsepower rotaries, which the D-8 could utilize. It was all too late. Only 36 were delivered to the front line before the armistice. But the Flying Razor, as it was called, had the distinction of scoring Germany's last aerial victory of the war. The Allies broke through Germany's Siegfried Line. German soldiers in the field laid down their arms and surrendered. Four years of hell in the trenches of the Western Front were over. The air services had been spared the horror of existence in the trenches, but at times their life expectancy had been measured in days. Those who lived to the armistice with their bodies intact had every reason to celebrate. Northern French towns that had been occupied by Germans since 1914 were reclaimed by their countrymen. Families were reunited, with hope for a life beyond the war. In Paris, the coming of peace was celebrated with energy and flair. Once in 1914 and again in 1918, the enemy had approached within a few miles of the French capital. It had been bombed by German aircraft in the first weeks of the war. But all that was over. The Kaiser's effigy could be ridiculed. But in the Paris Victory Parade, the air services were not represented. A French pilot protested. His flight under the Arc de Triomphe got him into trouble, but he made his point. The German military machine was dismantled. The Fokker D-7 fighter was the only aircraft specifically mentioned in the armistice terms. At Koblenz in Germany, the remaining D-7s were handed over to the Allies, but not before Tony Fokker succeeded in smuggling a few into Holland. From the air, the devastation caused by four years of shells and bombs was clear, but at last, the constant thunder of those years was silenced. The sound of aircraft engines crossing the front died away. What contribution had aircraft made to those terrible years? There's no question that all the major powers came to believe very quickly in the effectiveness of military aviation. Evolution was dramatic in terms of numbers, money spent, and the speed of technological development. Aircraft and pilots did not determine the outcome of the war. 
it was won and lost on the ground at immense cost. But aircraft became crucial in supporting armies on the battlefield. Control of the skies became an essential factor in victory on the ground. Long-range bombing, the foundation of strategic aviation, was pioneered. The basic techniques of aerial combat were established for the remainder of the century. The world found itself with a great new industry, aviation, and was captivated by the excitement and boundless extent of its possibilities. A young aviator lay dying at the start of a bright summer's day. To the mechanics assembled around him, these few parting words he did say. Take the cylinder out of my kidneys, the connecting rod out of my brain. From the small of my back take the crankshaft and assemble the engine again.